this afternoon. Um, so uh, when we're not speaking, please ensure your camera is switched off and that your microphone is muted. That will allow us to avoid any background noise during the session. And um, we will be recording this session to share with all delegates afterwards. So please keep this in mind when posting anything in the chat. If for any reason your internet or laptop connection fails, please note down the dial in details so that you can call back into the meeting. Uh, these can be found in the meeting details option um, above and I can post them in the chat um, in a moment. And please use the chat function during the session for any thoughts, comments or questions which you have and we'll respond to these at the end of the session. And um, you can also use the raise hand function to indicate you'd like to ask a question at the end of the session. OK, so our speaker today um, is Adrian Hall, um, who is one of my colleagues, one of my good colleagues in OPSS. So I'll hand over to Adrian now. Thank you. OK, thanks. Thanks, Jackie. Uh, hi, yeah, I'm Adrian Hall. I've been with OPSS in its various guises now for about 10 years. Um, I'm an EHO by background. Uh, and I've worked in various areas of um, OPSS, including primary authority, and I've done quite a lot of work with fire service over the over the years. I now work uh, in the construction products team as the new national regulator for construction products, and that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. Um, I'm just going to attempt to share my screen. Hopefully this will work. Um, bear with me. Sorry, last time I did this, it worked a lot. Uh, it was a lot more straightforward. Can everybody see? Can you see the screen? Oh no, that's the wrong. Are you able to see the screen, Jackie? Yeah, we can see the screen. You just need to do it into presenter mode. Yep, yeah, perfect. That's it. Right. Brilliant. Brilliant. Hey, we got there. Um. OK, so I'm going to talk to you today about our new role as the construction product regulator. Um, I'm going to give you some background uh, and some data around the uh, construction products uh, sector in the UK. Talk briefly about the Grenfell um, Tower tragedy, the inquiry and the Dame Judith Hackett report. We'll look at some issues with the existing regulatory framework around construction, wider construction regulation, not just um, construction products. And I'll talk about the sort of things that we're doing uh, to address the issues in relation to to construction products. Uh, and then hopefully we'll have some time for some questions at the end. OK, so the construction product industry is massive. Um, manufacturing in the UK gross added value to the economy is 20 to 40 billion. 325,000 employees and 21,000 firms. Um, estimated turnover of the entire construction product industry is 40 to 60 billion. Uh, and 75% of all construction products used in the UK are made in the UK. It must be one of the few sectors where, which has such a high proportion of um, products that are used in the UK that are actually manufactured in the UK. Um, and also the sector is, is critical for delivering on you know, some of the government's main uh, policy areas and priorities, levelling up, build back better, net zero, etc. So a huge, huge sector. Right, Grenfell Tower. Um, so we've all seen the news. A lot of us have probably listened to the podcast of the inquiry and it has been incredibly depressing listening um, from, you know, just a, a the general perspective as a member of the public, but also, you know, as a as a regulator, listening to the failings, the litany of, of failings that e exist in the lead up to Grenfell is is quite depressing. Um, bottom line priority that came out time and time again, profits over over safety, profits over over compliance. The absence of accountability, the duplicity, the, the sort of dissembling that was done by manufacturers and suppliers of the of the products was absolutely extraordinary 
and you know overall basically an absence of any any, any effective regulation so yeah a, a, you know, a depressing occurrence and um an inquiry uh, on the back of that, Jane Judith Hackett released her report. It was a wide ranging report. I've just pulled out a few sort of thoughts here, but it was absolutely damning of uh, <laughs> of the, the sector. Basically, you know, current regulation of the construction not the purpose. Um, regulators, in particular, operate in silos. No national oversight with respect to construction products regulation and the lack of national. <clears throat> Uh, and very, very little construction product regulation uh, undertaken. There are many, many other issues that Dame Judy Packett raised, um, including competence around installers, um, criticism of the building control uh, process, um, et cetera. Those are the, the, the main ones in relation to, um, to this presentation today. So in terms of construction regulation, the three main um, regulators are around well, construction product regulation, building control and fire and rescue services. There are others. Uh, so environmental health have a role. Um, HSC have a role. Uh, there, are, there are various others, but the main three areas are those. Um, we've listed We've talked about the, the main issues around construction product regulation leading up to, to Grenfell and absence of any form of national leadership um, when it comes to construction product regulation. Um, at a local level, very, very low priority for local authorities. Um, very few construction products get complained about. It's not just like it's not like normal products. Um, you know, people don't tend to uh, yeah, com complain about construction products and without any leadership um, and direction set at a, a national level it's not surprising that um, very little regulation has been din done in this sector building controls um, an interesting area um, back in the 80s um, the concept of approved regulators was introduced so that provided or started some sort of sort of market competition between building control services provided by local authorities and the newly formed approved inspectors which are within the private sector that in itself seemed to be absolutely fine and worked well for a period uh, until the the concept of risk-based inspection um, plans were introduced prior to that um, the frequency of inspection of the building site was more or less sort of dictated in, in regulation. After that, each uh, building site, a risk assessment could be done and a decision made by either the improved inspector or local authority building control. The risk assessment could be done to sort of work out how often um, a site should be visited, if at all, um, in some instances. Um, as a consequence of of this it was a bit of a race to the, the the bottom risk assessments were done and frequency of inspections were reduced uh, local authority building control services felt the need to compete um, price wise so you know also felt the need to, to reduce frequency of inspections and yeah we are where where we are with with that as a as a result um, fire and rescue services their involvement um, is kind of right at the start in terms of the approval of plans, the planning process and the building control process, and right at the end, uh, dealing with the, um, you know, the, in many, some instances, the tragic consequences of failures um, in buildings. Fire and rescue services, I've done quite a lot of work with um, with fire over the years, and for you know many years, they've been complaining uh, about A, the, the lack of opportunity and lack of time they get to review plans um, for uh, planning purposes or building control purposes. Um, they feel sort of blindsided in many instances, given very short timescales to to respond to um, to consultation and also complain about the, uh, the lack of information available, especially to novel uh, products being used and specified by by architects. Um, they also have complained um, over the years about sort of the, the competence of installers. They've come across instances time and time again uh, where uh, construction has been undertaken in uh, in in with 
with very very sort of poor sort of competence levels and there's a really interesting um, example it was at a fire primary authority conference um it was about four years ago now where a, a woman who who worked for uh, a management company they managed generally managed student accommodation new um, block of student accommodation that had been commissioned by a local authority the the, the construction was complete, the building was signed off and passed by uh, building control. The woman from the, the management company went to look at the building and instantly came away with a litany of examples of incompetent workmanship, but in particular incompetent workmanship that compromised fire safety. So there had been firewalls that had been breached to pass services through, like pipes, wires, Wi-Fi, etc that hadn't been sealed up so the fire integrity of the building had been compromised she went back to the the local authority who owned the the building and was told that the building's been passed by building control um so she needs to take on the building and start Adrian, sorry, you've gone on to mute, I think. Uh, hello, is that better? Yeah, you're back now. All right, sorry about that. Um, right, so on the back of all this, um, OPSS uh, uh, were appointed as the National Construction Product Regulator from January 2021, um, and we should be fully operational um, in April 2023 if the bill goes ahead as planned um, there are rumors that it is possibly going to be a, a few months delay on that but that's the sort of um, the current target um the idea is that we will take the national lead uh dame judith hackett was very clear about the absence of a, a national lead and oversight in construction uh, products regulation so that will be uh, our, our primary primary role and the delivery of construction product, product regulation will be between ourselves and local authority uh, trading standards. Um, the building safety regulator uh, is also being created. The new building safety regulator is part of the HSE and will have oversight of national building control. It will also deliver building control services for high rise buildings, buildings over 18 metres. And it's also doing a hell of a lot of work with industry uh, competences, um, which is the, the the thing I mentioned earlier that fire fire services have been talking about for a for a long time. So two new construction sector regulators. Right, I'm struggling now to change slides. Oh, there we go. Right, so in our role as the our new role as the National Construction Product Regulator, so th these are the sort of things that we were thinking about when we were first when we were first appointed. So, you know, how does the existing system system work? Is the existing system fit for purpose? Now, that seems like a bit of a strange question given everything that we saw in Grenfell and the Dame Judith Hackett report, but it is the case that you can have a perfectly good uh, regulatory framework um, that's just not implemented or, or enforced in any way. Um, I think we, we know what the answer to that is now, but it was a genuine question at the, uh, at the start of our, our journey. What should a new construction product regulation framework look like? Um, what are the tools that are needed, sanctions, definitions, um, etc. What construction product data and intelligence is available? What's out there? What data have we got so that we can start making decisions on about risk and, and targeting of enforcement activity? And how do the relationships between construction sector regulators work? What was Dame Judith talking about when she was talking about the fact that they operate in, in silos? Right, so the existing framework, what is a construction product? Well, within, within the existing framework, there are designated standards and a product is only a construction product if it has a designated 
standard so that immediately excludes a whole raft of um of of products so for, for example fire doors there is no construction product designated standard for a fire door so the, the regulation of fire doors falls under building control um, uh, regulation at, as it stands at the moment. However, for a fire door set, so that's a fire door with the frame, with the hinges, with the handles, there is a designated standard. So it's it's kind of a, a mad situation where fire door, a fire door on its own isn't a construction product, but a fire door set is a construction product. What about the quality of the, the existing standards? Um, well, from what we've seen, they can be quite vague and open to sort of wide interpretation. And there was a case um, about eight months ago where a local authority uh, had concerns over some electrical electric cables that were being imported into the country. They got the technical file from the, the importer. Um, the cables had been tested in an appropriate test lab. And had, be, and, and had been passed, um, given, given a certificate of conformance. Local authorities still weren't happy, so they sent the cables off for testing themselves to a different test lab. Their results came back the, re, the reverse. The, the cables failed the, um, the test in relation to fire. Um, they went back to the, the importer. The importer was adamant that he'd had, they'd had it properly tested. So the local authority came to us for some help and guidance. So we took the, the cables and we sent them off to a third test house for testing. The third test house came back and said, both tests are correct. The standards are so vague that it can be interpreted in either way. So both the uh, the test results are correct, which I think you'll agree is a is a kind of mad situation to um, to end up in. There are also issues over the complexity of some of the standards and here I'm thinking in particular around insulation panels. Um, the, the complexity of the testing and the frequency of testing uh, is so great that it, it you know, on, on, on first look it makes you wonder how any manufacturer can, can actually comply with the, um, the complexity of the, the standards and the testing, but also from a regulator's point of view how can you ever possibly regulate when things are so, so complex? Um, and th that brings us on to the reliability of construction products themselves. Can industry, can the uh, construction companies, can the sector rely on construction products? Um, we asked uh, one of the, the large national construction contractors to come and talk to us about their quality procedures um, a few months ago, we were interested from you know to get their perspective on on construction products and how they manage them on their on their sites. And in passing, they mentioned the fact that they send every batch of bricks that comes on site. They send a sample off for testing. Um, so we stop them and, and question them a bit further. And the the reason they do it is because uh, they've been they've had their fingers burnt in the past. They've got halfway through a construction, they've built two stories of uh, of a new construction and it's come to their attention, um, noticed by one of the brickers, that the, the bricks are substandard. They sent one off for testing and he was absolutely right, the bricks are substandard. So that's to demolish everything they they built. So now every batch of bricks that comes on site, they send a sample off for testing. Every double glazed unit that comes on site, they test on site to make to ensure um, uh, that it's compliant. I think you'll agree that um, it's a strange situation where uh, you know a builder, a construction company can't rely on on products that are coming on site. They can't rely on the documentation that comes along with those products and feels the need uh, to send products off for uh, for testing. It's it, it's kind of quite damning of the of the sector. Um, so the relationship between construction sector regulators, um, James Dude Hackett talks about silo working and absence of effective communication, and I think most of the 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 regulators will absolutely absolutely agree with that. Certainly, local authority building control um, that I've been speaking to and 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 fire would uh, would concur concur with that. Um, a really good example of that illustrates sort of lack of 
of communication and, and interconnection between the regulators is around heritage glazing. So where um, uh, there's, a, there's a building that's classed as a heritage building, so it might be in a conservation area, it might be a listed building, it will have a certain type of, of glazing that generally has quite narrow um, glazing bars. Um, under those circumstances, there are exemptions in building regs um, so that uh, planners can specify either single glazing or secondary glazing inside the building or double glazed units with a, with a much reduced margin so that uh, you can still use the, the, the narrow glazing bars in, in the present in heritage buildings. So it gives planners the flexibility to maintain the appearance um, of a heritage building, which is fine. Um, what we're being told, though, by the glazing industry is that it's not possible to make double glazed units with small uh, glazing, but um, small margins uh, around the edge that are compliant with the construction products regulations. Um, but there is no transfer over of the of the sort of the, the delegation or the exemption in building regs into construction product regs. So the 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 proposition is is that when a, a planner is specifying um, double glazed units with a with a small margin, it's not possible to make them to to construction product regulations, uh, but they are being supplied by certain manufacturers as as meeting the standard. And it's an example where uh, building control and construction products uh, regulator regulation policy just haven't had the conversation. Um, there needs to be either uh, a continuation or a, a mirroring of that exemption in um, construction products regulation or planners should only be able to specify single glazing or uh, second secondary glazing. Uh, I think it's one of many areas of intersection between regulators uh, where there are problems and I think we're going to come across more and more of those as we um, as we go on. So construction products intelligence and and data so when we, we first set out we put out our feelers what data's out there uh, and we found very very little data uh, out there um, very very few products get um, Get reported as for for investigation or, or as problems. Um, there was a lot of uh, anecdotal uh, evidence from uh, people like Building Control and and Fire and Rescue Services. Um, and as a result of the, the the data that was available and the anecdotal data, we've been able to put together a list of five priority uh, product types that we're going to start uh, start looking at and we're going to start doing some screen testing to to get some data on the levels of of, of compliance of, of those products. So the idea is that we now start to build up uh, our understanding of uh, of the sector and what's what's out there. Um, we've also started to undertake some um, some research. So we've been doing some supply chain research. We're interested in the supply chain from design right and up to the point of inclusion of the product in the building. So going through the manufacturing, the distribution, what feedback mechanisms are in there. Um, so from the end user back to the manufacturer or the or the designer and to understand where the risks uh, can arise. We're interested in the documentation that um, that goes with the construction product, the marketing materials, the technical files. We want to understand every step of the process so we can um, understand uh, our risk modelling um, uh, uh, in a much more comprehensive way. And that leads us on to the, the second point is, is around risk. What do we understand by risk um, in relation to to construction products. We absolutely need to understand where the risks arise uh, to behave uh, as a responsible regulator. We need this to understand risk so that we can do effective prioritisation, uh, take a proportionate approach, be consistent uh, and basically deliver um, targeted, targeted regulation. Um, so the new construction products regulation um, uh, we're going to maintain a standards based approach so the existing designated standards will will stay um, 
Of course, the, as, as there is at the moment, will continue to be a, a process of, of amendment and review um, of, of standards. Um, we will introduce a new definition of, uh, of construction products so that construction products aren't just restricted to, to those products that have um, a designated standard. So there'll be a new definition that encompasses um, many more products that are used in, in construction. Um, we're introducing a general safety requirement uh, on manufacturers and suppliers, and we're introducing a requirement for manufacturers suppliers to undertake a product uh, risk assessment. We're also introducing new new penalties. Maximum fine at the moment for a breach under the construction products regs is five thousand pounds, and we're going to um, modernise that and make it unlimited. Bring it in line with many other areas of of regulation. So we've 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 taken the the existing structure and we've built on it and we've we're making it more in line with um, other areas of product regulation, but also just general areas of, of regulation, like you know, food safety, health and safety, um, introducing the the idea of risk assessment and and general safety safety requirements. Um, working with stakeholders. Uh, so um, my main role is to manage the relationships with other regulators within the, the construction sector. Um, we've we've set up and we've we're developing very good relationships with uh, local authority building control, the building safety regulator, and building on the relationships that we already have with them um, with the, the fire sector. We're involving those regulators in our thinking around policy. We're involving them in our road testing workshops where we're um, developing policy. We've involved them uh, in our systems thinking so that um, we can understand where the intersections are uh, with us and the other regulators and they can understand it as well. And we can work on those intersections to ensure that they work. So for example, incident management, where there's an incident, how are we as the, the 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 regulators getting together to manage that incident and make sure that everybody is involved where they they should be involved obviously communications um communications with um with stakeholders in general so the the the, con the construction industry manufacturers importers construction companies um making sure they know who we are, what's happening in this sector now, laying out our expectations and laying out our, um, our approach to, to regulation. And we're also getting involved and supporting industry initiatives. I'm glad to say there are, there are a couple of uh, initiatives that have come out of, of industry. Uh, one is the code for, um, sorry, building, building a safer future and the code for uh, construction products and, and information so we're doing whatever we can to uh to help and support those initiatives to to in, ensure their their success we're also working um with trading standards um so at the moment uh if a trading standards uh, department is investigating a, a construction product we're there to offer training around construction products. We're, we're there to help and to finance testing if they need to test a product. Uh, we're, we're there to provide technical support and advice to help them review technical files and also to provide legal support if there's further follow on um, enforcement work that needs to be done. We're also building with that and we're working, we've had conversations and we're having more conversations with trading standards departments uh, to develop a, a sort of a, a larger working relationship where a trading standards department will deliver work on our, our behalf. Um, so I mentioned the five priority product areas uh, earlier. It, there's potential for some for some formal sampling of, of products to be undertaken and be, we'll be working with trading standards departments to deliver that. We'll be paying for officer time, but we'll also be uh, providing the same things around training, um, providing the funding uh, for testing, uh, technical support and, and legal support. Um, so if anybody's on the call is interested in, in, in working with us on any of, of that, then, then just get in, get in touch. Um, OK, that has been um, a bit of a, a whistle stop tour around construction products regulation and our role in the wider um, framework around construction regulation. Um, thank you for listening.
Um, are there any questions? Adrian, there's a few questions in the chat. So, so the first one is, um, I've just literally gone off my screen. Uh, can you tell us what the five priority areas are? Um, I can't on this call. I'm I'm afraid I can't. <laughs> I think I I think I have them. So so I, no, I, I know. I'm completely wrong, Adrian. Tell me, but I believe it's cladding okay. and insulation. Yeah, sorry, to, um, it's, it's not that I don't know what they are. It's just that I, I'm not able to say on this call because I understand the sort of the mixture of people on on the call. I don't think we're in a position to. I believe. For everyone with a .gov UK address, what I'll do is I'll send uh, the five, the list of five out. Yeah, um, it's because the the actual week of wonder events have been opened up to business as well. Um, we'll yeah, we'll leave it there and I'll send them out uh, to the .gov .uk address people after the session. Yeah, it's just that we haven't publicised to industry yet what our um what those areas areas are. Sorry, sorry, Jackie. No worries. The next question, will OPSS be producing a construction product safety incident plan like consumer products? Uh, I think the answer to that is yes, uh, definitely. Um, it's something that we're um, going to be developing in conjunction with the building safety regulator um, in their new role, which also encompasses uh, obviously building control and the National Fire Chiefs Council. Okay. Uh, the next one, how do you see cohesive working between local authority TS, health and safety executive, building control, etc., to ensure we all work in a standard approach and together? Uh, yeah, that is exactly um, what we're trying to deliver at the moment. Um, as I've, I've said, we're building very good relationships with the um, construction and the other regulators within the, the construction sector and also we're starting to work with uh, with training standards and and get them involved and on board with the the work as well so the the ultimate um the ultimate vision is for to, uh, not a seamless sort of service across all four but certainly a high level of communication so we all know exactly what we're doing we've got um uh, common um, procedures around so incident management for for example um but yeah that is that is that is certainly one of the aims brilliant so that's it for the questions in the chat um if anybody wants to um put their hand up and ask any further questions was that another question that just appeared in the, the chat yes yeah, so yeah, is the support available now or when you are fully operational? So it's, after it's, April available now. It's, it's available now, yeah. Any further questions? How do you aim to increase support by local authorities? If you consider that they regard it as a low priority, ah, that's a that's a really interesting question, and also compounded uh, with the fact that you know local authority budgets have been cut so much over the over the past twenty years, and there's if issues around recruitment. I think you know, training standards departments um, you know, face huge problems. Um, what I would say is that the trading standards, the conversations I've had with trading standards uh, departments up to now have been very, very positive. I think given the the, the profile um, of construction products regulation and the problems that have been highlighted through Grenfell, I think um, the conversations I've had so far, heads of service are very keen to get involved despite the uh, you know the issues and the and the hurdles in involved. Okay, so any final questions? Just a few minutes left. Yes, Caroline. Hi, can I just chip in and, you know, some of you on the call are recognised and hi to you all. 
I'm Caroline in the local delivery team and we just wanted to mention that for um, primary authority providers in the construction products sector, we do have a construction products PA panel, I'm not sure if it's been mentioned. So if you'd like to join that, please get in touch. Um, and we do have speakers from other government departments as well as OPSS on there. So I'll put the local delivery email in the chat and if it's something you're interested in joining, if you're in that sector, not already on that panel, um, please, you're welcome to join and contribute uh, by that route as well. So that's it. I just wanted to chip in with that. Thanks. Thanks, Caroline. So one more question that's just come through. Is any more funding likely to come to LA's given potential risks um, of such a person accountability post Grenfell? Yeah, the, the conversations that I'm having with uh, trading standards at the moment is around sort of funding. So we get a budget from um, department for, for levelling up um, community and housing uh, and we're using some of that to fund local authorities in delivering um, construction product regulation in part. So the five priority product areas that I mentioned mentioned earlier. Uh, so any additional work that uh, local authorities will be asked to do will be will be fully uh, recoverable. All right, a further question. Do you have information on the support available that can be sent out to local authorities? Uh, yeah, I think there's a letter that was sent out to all heads of service. I can I can get hold of, of that, which sort of lays out what our sort of offer is in terms of um, technical support and testing, et cetera, et cetera. I can get hold of that. And um, if Jackie, if you want to circulate that. Yep, absolutely. Yep, happy to send that out. OK, so if there's no further questions, then we'll draw the session to a close. Thank you very much for your time, Adrian. OK, thanks all for listening. Thank you. And thanks everyone for attending. Um, there is further sessions um, on this afternoon. If you do still want to 